The new and improved monster manual is still a long way off, but the first creatures that I have always planned on looking at are chromatic dragons. Because in 2014, they were basically just big bags of hit points that included some really horrific breath. And if I wanted that, I'd just eat garlic bread at every meal. Anyway, that's why I was so excited to see the ancient green dragon stat block released at Gen Con. Because it actually feels like a green. And it also showcases or hints a number of design and rules possibilities that we haven't heard about from wizards yet. Keep in mind the important caveat that this is all based upon a picture of something that we're apparently not supposed to share around wildly yet. There's probably still time given the release schedule for the monster manual to undergo several more iterations before it reaches its final form if it ever does. But here's a couple of things in that stat block that I noticed that I think are leaning us in the right direction, beginning with the tightening of attacks. Chromatic dragons and other creatures in the monster manual have consistently had a form of bloat built into them that was designed in order to give us flavor, but often just sort of slowed things down in play. For instance, chromatic dragons had three different weapons that were all essentially for the same purpose of pummeling things in close combat. Their tail, bite, and claw were all there, and a multi-attack involved a mix of two, with legendary actions getting to use a third, and it essentially just sort of gummed up the works with a lot of extra text that was basically just trying to tell us that we should be describing our our attacks as using different parts of the dragon's massive, deadly body. From a design standpoint, that's not necessarily a bad thing because we want to encourage that in our DMs, but from a sheer readability standpoint, it made dragons look as if they had complication when in reality they did not. This released version of the ancient green dragon instead shows a rend attack that looks like it's a little bit of a mixture of the options of the other weapons, meaning that we can narrate it as using whatever part of the dragon makes the most sense for the battle that's ongoing, and we just use the same attack to differentiate between it. The one mechanical difference that comes from this is that because in uh, 2014 dragons different attacks had different reaches, it meant that moving near to a dragon could provoke opportunity attacks without you leaving its overall reach, whereas now you'll only ever provoke an opportunity attack for leaving the 15-foot reach of an ancient green dragon's rend attack, where before the claws and bite and tail all had separate reaches. Second, green dragons still have terrible breath. They need to lay off the garlic. But this poisonous gas cloud no longer has a bunch of unnecessary text explaining that the dragon is going to breathe its breath weapon out in a 90-foot cone, which then causes... Instead, it's all broken down into simplified form, very similar to as if you were reading your way through a spell. It tells you in an order that feels very codified and straightforward what you're going to be doing with the breath weapon from a mechanical standpoint, rather than in a narrative standpoint so that you're required to read through it in order to be able to parse it at the table. This is a minor quality of life improvement that I think is something that Wizards is leaning into in order to make sure that when you are using the stat block at the table, it's easy to use the stat block instead of that the stat block is telling you the story about what the monster is doing. This is similar to how Rend is simplifying three different attacks into one, and it's just something to make running the monster easier at the table. Third, and this one was kind of a biggie for me, is that they built spellcasting into an ancient dragon. This is not necessarily a design point, but it's something that was so necessary in order to differentiate the different dragons from one another and to give them stuff that made them feel cool. The sidebar in the 2014 edition that had the option to include spellcasting for dragons was pretty much necessary in order to make a chromatic dragon feel like something awesome and interesting, but it required you to come up with the spells that fit your theme instead of just having them provided for you. This makes the green dragon feel more like a green dragon and includes a couple of neat little things. For instance, the inclusion of leveled up spells to the appropriate degree of oomph that the dragon deserves, like Cloud Kill being able to be cast at 8th level and Dissonant Whispers at will as a level 4 spell instead of a 1st level spell, just so that it hits hard enough to really be felt at the table. It's also made all the more 
your green by being included as part of the dragon's multi-attack by sacrificing a rend in order to use spellcasting, making the green dragon's deceptive, spellcastery, charming sort of personality come out in the stat block. It's straightforward, it's simple, and it fits nicely. The fourth thing I noticed was a general rebalancing of a handful of numbers. Statistics were generally increased, while saving throws and skill proficiencies were reduced to simplify the stat block as much as possible and to give the dragon a more even sort of set of saving throws without them being quite so wild. Sticking to two saving throw proficiencies for the dragon instead of the four that they got previously seems like a big change until you take a look at the improvement to their stat that makes that a little bit more balanced out. This set a much more even tone to the saving throws instead of having certain ones that were just blowing things out of the water, but more interesting was the layout of statistics and saves. Now, saving throw modifiers are included right next to the statistic modifier so that you don't have to go looking at both the stat and the saves section in order to determine whether or not you're adding proficiency modifier. And speaking of proficiency modifier, that's now included down in the XP section so that you have the number on hand should you need to use it on the fly. I think that including your saves in the individual statistics is another of those quality of life improvements that shows that Wizards is paying attention to trying to make sure that the experience of using a creature at the table is a good one. The fifth item is actually the one that stood out first to me when I saw the stat block, probably because it's included at the top of the sheet. Because I'm talking about the initiative modifier. In the case of this dragon, there's a couple of very interesting things included here that hint at stuff to come. For instance, a ancient greed dragon, despite only having a plus one dexterity modifier, has a plus eight to their initiative, which means that they are getting proficiency in initiative. This could be something that's going across the board to all monsters or specific to individual ones, but either way, it's an inclusion that we haven't seen previously. It does not include a special trait anywhere else in the stat block that delineates the fact that their initiative modifier is including their proficiency bonus, which lends me to think a little more towards the possibility that this is going to be a common occurrence or even something baked into the entirety of the monster system. But time will have to tell on that one. Meanwhile, it also includes a passive initiative score in parentheses. Whether or not this means they're going to be encouraging more use of initiative scores versus initiative rolling remains to be seen, but the fact that they're including it certainly hints that they're trying to provide more support for alternative initiative systems. And incidentally, ancient green dragons have a battle-ready condition that gives them advantage on initiative, which also, of course, adjusts their passive by five. The sixth thing that I noted in this stat block is probably not one that will make people tremendously happy in that legendary resistance is going to continue into the new edition and looks like it's remaining unchanged in terms of functionality. Much as we would like to see more nuanced legendary resistances that involve some kind of trade-off or fallback or item that's destroyed or other option that is changed upon a character sheet, the fact that the number has changed from three to four on a regular basis and five in a lair does suggest a couple of interesting things in that basically your legendary resistance are either now going to be determined by your experience points value or CR of your creature or perhaps by tier or simply on a case by case basis. But we're no longer, it looks like, going to be seeing a flat three no matter what creature it is that's being brought out. This has been teased in a few other places, such as the Dragonborn of Tiamat from Fizban's Treasury of Dragons, but it's interesting to note it in a creature in the new books. And the fact that a dragon in its lair is more resistant to magic than otherwise is a nice little touch, I think. The seventh thing that I noticed was one that is a personal pet peeve of mine, which was that legendary actions have been replaced on the dragon with legendary reactions. I admittedly am not a big fan of legendary reactions, where creatures get multiple reactions in a round instead of having legendary action options to take place between people's turns, and if you're interested in why, I have a video around here somewhere about all that. I don't know whether or not this is a shift that's going to be done throughout the entirety of the monster manual, but the fact that it's included in the titular dragon seems telling. 
That said, the specific options that the Green Dragon has been given don't feel quite as egregious as some of the others in terms of interrupting the flow of a player's turn or taking away their agency by removing options from them. Also of note is that when you are within the dragon's lair, the dragon gains an extra reaction to use its legendary reactions with, which essentially means that you no longer have a separate table or portion of the stat block you need to refer to at initiative 20, and instead you can just run the dragon exactly the same, only a little more amped up if your adventurers can't lure the thing outside of its home base. That's another quality of life improvement that I think was a good choice by wizards. Even if it does mean that we won't have quite as many flavorful options. As mentioned, the legendary actions for the dragon itself do have a variety of different options, including one that triggers at the end of another creature's turn that the dragon can see, which is essentially the trigger for a legendary action. Using this one on a regular basis in monster design essentially means that we don't need to differentiate a legendary action as long as our reactions have a trigger similar to this. And honestly, that offsets a lot of my annoyance with the reaction game. Interestingly, one of the options inside of the legendary actions includes an ongoing debuff that reduces people's armor class when affected by it by two. This numerical debuff is a huge rarity in 2014's 5e. Slow is the only other one that springs to mind. Do you think that we're going to see more numerical buffs and debuffs in 2025's Monster Manual? As a nice touch, the eighth item is that immunities have been condensed, getting rid of the separate damage immunities and condition immunities, and just placing them all on one line so there's just one place to check for stuff that doesn't hurt your dragon. And finally, the ninth thing that I noticed was that dragons are no longer frightening. Okay, that's not actually true. This green dragon is way more terrifying than the old dragon ever was. But dragons, at least chromatic ancient green ones, no longer include the frightening presence trait. In ways, from a flavor standpoint, this makes me kind of sad, but from a mechanical standpoint, I am excited to see it go. Frightening presence was always sort of an afterthought in the actual combat of a great big dragon, and it was so easy to overcome so swiftly and become immune to that it rarely had as big an impact on the game as I think it was factored into the game design of the challenge rating of the creature. While dragons might not be causing the frightened condition anymore, I think that they're going to be far more terrifying at the table. What do you think? I know that I'm excited to pick up the new monster manual when it finally releases, and I'll still be checking Chromatic Dragons first and foremost when I do, but I think that I can safely say that I'll be doing so with a lot more hope than I would have done previously. Until then, I'll be excitedly looking out for any spoilers that tell us more about the monsters in the 2024 edition. Have any stood out to you that I've missed? Let me know in the comments down below. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching. And as always, happy adventuring.